Miracy. I had gotten into a dark place with money and had to work myself through that and out of that so that I could embrace abundance and truly go from survival mode and just surviving into thriving, then into affluence and beyond that. Hello, I'm Katie Valentine, and you're listening to Soul Savvy Business. I am a soul-minded spiritual entrepreneur, a Christian minister, and a New Testament scholar, but don't let that scare you. I support all paths to the divine, and I use tools such as chakras, dreams, and intuition to get there. On this podcast, we explore the intersection of business and spirituality. What do I mean by that? Too often, we separate our business selves from our spiritual selves, but in doing that, we don't leverage the full potential of either one. This series aims to help you fall in love with your own soul so that you can live your most fulfilling and successful life. On today's episode, I'll be talking with a CEO and business coach who helps other coaches run successful coaching businesses. But first. In every episode, I offer a tip around abundance and your spiritual journey. Do you take the time to dream about your business and with your business regularly? This was asked to me recently, and I realized that I had been neglecting to take the time to just sit and dream with my business during what was a very busy time. If you've been listening to Soul Savvy Business for a while, you'll know that I think our businesses have their own energy, and that energy is tied to us as their creators, but businesses also have their own energy, and they have their own personalities. And it's critical that we take time to dream with the energy of our businesses. My method is really simple. It's just me, some quiet space, and maybe a notebook. And this has the benefit of me getting away from the endless, endless task, all the stuff that makes our businesses run, but can't interfere with the dreaming if we're only doing those tasks. And this is where the abundance is really important because it begins to flourish when we're able to dream big and to let our businesses dream big too. And this is the order that I've experienced when working with the energy of businesses. Dreaming big clarifies our intentions. From our intentions, we set goals. And then from our goals, we create strategies and tasks to fulfill those strategies. The abundance of your business starts always in that dreaming big phase and then gets fulfilled through intentions, goals, and the tasks. So don't delay, get quiet with your business soon so that you can dream big and bring in that abundance. My guest today is Melinda Cohen. Melinda is the CEO of The Coaches Console, a seven-figure software, training, and coaching company that has helped thousands of coaches create profitable and thriving businesses. She is a systems expert who helps coaches get over the tedious task of running their businesses and focus on what they actually love, the actual coaching of amazing clients. Plus, she is the host of her own podcast, Just Between Coaches. Welcome to the show, Melinda. Thank you, Katie. It's so good to be here. I'm so curious and I'm so happy to have you. Uh, Did anything resonate with you in the tip today, the abundance tip on the topic of just dreaming big, especially with your business? Well, it's interesting, as I was listening to you to describe the tip, of course, I'm taking notes because it's just what I do. Uh, But at the time of recording this, we're in the early January dates, and I am taking a considerable amount of time to rejuvenate and dream in my business. Like literally exactly what you just said, sitting around, staring out the window, which seems odd at times. It's like, what am I doing? But just sitting around, staring out the window, taking my puppy for a walk, doing these seemingly unrelated things. But what I know in my 18 years of doing this is that is a critical part of the creation process and bringing new ideas to life, bringing new opportunities uh, so that they can come to pass, that we have to have this. And as one of my good friends shared with me and taught me over the last few years, 
when we skip this step, that is the fast path to burnout. Yeah. Like there's where burnout, overwhelm, resentment begins to come in. And it starts feeling like a job, not a mission or a calling and not the work that we love anymore. So I'm I'm in exactly that spot that you just talked about. And I love how you described how our business has its own energy and its own personality. And we have to fuel that. Yes. And respect it. Yeah. Re- respect it. Honor it. Listen to it. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes we get into our thinking brain, and while that's a necessary part of the ingredient, if we forget to bring in that which is greater than us, we can really miss out on a lot of key things. Well, that just leads perfectly into the next question, which I ask each guest. How would you describe what you consider to be the divine? What word or words do you use? Well, that's interesting. I use a a collection of them. I grew up as a preacher's kid. My dad's a minister. He's retired now. So God, the divine. I also use, as I expanded beyond just religion into what I consider the spiritual realm, the universe is another word that resonates with me. And then the phrase that I just said earlier, that which is greater than you. Uh, And it's really just that truly, which is greater than you, whatever label you give to it, I have found that it's less about the label and more about the interaction and relationship that you have to beyond just your human physical self. Well, you gave us such a little mic drop there, which is that you grew up as a preacher's kid. So tell us a little bit about yeah. that. What was what was your religious <laughs> or your spiritual upbringing? And there's lots of different kinds of preachers out there too. So what, what was that environment like for you? So my dad, uh, he was minister of Christian Church Disciples of Christ. And one of the, the beliefs that I grew up with was that there was one truth, many paths. And my dad was a very welcoming individual as a minister and also created that culture in the church and the congregation that we were at. And so all walks of life were certainly welcome. And I grew up with that inclusive type of experience since I was a little girl. We all believed in God But the way that we might label ourselves might look differently, but we could acknowledge that one truth, even though there might be many paths that we were on. So you're going to laugh because I'm also an ordained Christian church Disciples of Christ minister. What? I know. Well, that's crazy. I feel sure your father and I know many, many people in common because we are a fairly small group, uh, mostly in North America and Canada and a few other places around mm-hmm. the world. But if, if you know one disciple, you know, you have like 10, 15, 20 people mm-hmm. in common. So that's that's so great. Well, what, what has changed for you since your Disciples of Christ upbringing? Uh, where are you now? Have Has it been a continuous path or have there been you know, kind of ups and downs on the spiritual journey along the way? Well, I think all journeys are up and down, even if it is a continuous, you know, overall, it might be the upward spiral in the evolution, but there's always ups and downs, I believe. I think it's how we learn and grow and evolve as humans, as beings. When I was growing up, it was truly just focused on God, uh, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, uh, the Bible, the teachings from the Bible. And while that was good and very filling, I always felt like there was even more. And that's when I began to explore into the spirituality, the religion and the spirituality. It's not an either or for me. It's not one is right or one is better or one's wrong or worse or anything like that. But it's a, I think they both encompass each other. And the spirituality expands us beyond that into where we can find the divine and everything in nature, in relationships with each other, and that we can really find that spiritual essence within ourself. And so it's been an expansive journey um, into not just the divine, um, but into the divine feminine has been a big part of my journey over the past dozen years. Tell us more about that. What does that look like for you? Growing up, I loved listening to my dad preach. He was an he is an amazing speaker, an incredible leader, very inspiring. And I didn't really realize this, but I always would have these crinkles in my head. Uh, and I didn't understand this until I had hindsight looking back because I felt like there was this sense of like, hmm, that's great. I think there's something missing. I couldn't voice this back then, but after years of just becoming open to, having conversations with, reading, 
researching, really understanding the divine feminine, that it's about the divine masculine and the divine feminine that creates the whole. I really began to explore more of the divine feminine within not just, I'm not talking about men and women. I'm talking about within us, there's the divine masculine and the divine feminine, and there are different aspects to those levels of spirituality that help us tap into our essence so that we can be whole and complete. And I truly believe that we are simultaneously human beings here to have a spiritual experience and spiritual beings here to have a human experience. And the divine feminine helped me to really embrace that completeness. That's a wonderful, and the divine feminine has been part of my journey, especially the past four or five years and a very healing part of my journey as well. And I think the way you described it has been really in touch and in tune with with my journey. And growing up hearing a lot of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, where everything is very masculine language, even though the message may be that there's space for everyone, but when our language doesn't match that, it was a real journey for me to be able to even find the words or the feelings to be able to dive into that. Exactly. And, and being able to locate the language so that I can understand it was a big part of that, just understanding that part of me that hadn't been explored in growing up in church. I think in the church that I was in and with the father that I had, I had an incredible opportunity and a great chance at it. And then there was still some beyond that that I've, I've learned and explored. Yeah, I love that the, the, the phrase that you use, that which is beyond us, um, cannot be contained into any one form or one container, and that you've found this expansive way to explore. Yeah, and I think it's really interesting as business owners. I know for me with the Coaches Console, it was more of a mission that I felt was given to me. I had zero desire to be an entrepreneur. I loved having a job until I got fired from it. And then I was like, wow, the control freak in me does not want anybody in charge of my future like that. So I'm like, I'll start my own business. And that led me to the coach's console. And I feel like I was given this mission. It was a, a voice that I heard as I was riding down the highway. And as business owners, when we don't know how to pay attention to or get so busy that we forget to listen to that which is greater than us, we miss out on so much guidance or insight that can come to support us on our journey. And it it becomes a lot harder. But I've found that tapping into that which is greater than us often equips us with exactly what we need when we need it. So does that mission that was given to you, and I love that kind of encapsulates that energy, that it has its own energy and it, the energy partnered with you. Does this have anything to do with your napkin story? A little voice whispered to me to ask you about it. Mm. So I am, <laughs> I am asking you about it, if you're willing to share. Oh my gosh, yes. I, uh, at the time, I did not like the napkin story, but now I've come to love it. Yeah, I was minding my own business. I had just started my own coaching business, brand new, like with months, just months into it, filling my practice. And I filled my practice pretty quickly. Within six months, I was, I had replaced my income from the job I had been fired from. I was like, oh my God, this is so amazing that coaches can make this kind of money and do this kind of work. And this is awesome. And my coach at the time was like, "Uh, yeah, no, it's not like that. And I didn't really understand the struggles that coaches had. And I was like, okay, I was counting my blessings and just minding my own business. And I was riding down the highway with a friend who was driving. And all of a sudden I heard this voice. And because my dad's a minister, that voice was a familiar voice. And I knew to listen, even if it doesn't make sense. And it was just as if somebody was sitting next to me. I looked at my friend and he was like, I didn't say anything. I was like, huh, okay. And I kept just hearing these random words and phrases. And I pulled a napkin out of the glove box and I just started writing all the words and phrases that I was hearing, whether it made sense or not. And it was words and phrases like, now you'll do the same for others. I didn't know what that meant. It was words and phrases like, God given potential. Okay. Uh, It was words and phrases like, um, eliminate burdens and distractions was another one. And they were like just segments of stuff. And I was looking at the napkin and I was like, I don't know what this means, but I just kind of tucked it away. And I would pull it out every now and then out of the drawer. And I would look at it and be like, what is this? What am I, what am I supposed to do with this? 
And I would just keep it tucked away and I would keep going on about my business. And then when I was telling my coach how awesome it was for coaches to be able to start their own business and get clients and make this kind of money doing stuff that they love and wow, my God, this is so amazing. And she told me, no, most coaches struggle. All of a sudden, the idea from the napkin, it clicked. I was like, oh, burdens and distractions. Most coaches, their business is a burden and distraction. And she's like, yes, it is. And I was like, and because they're not good at business, they're not living their God-given potential. And she's like, that's right. Most coaches are struggling. I was like, oh, now I'll do the same for others. Now I'll help them in their business because I love business. I geek out systems, processes, efficiencies, all that stuff you have to have behind the scenes. I love that because the better that can be dialed in, the more freedom we have to do the work that we love. And all of a sudden the napkin made sense. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And immediately I knew... I didn't know what it meant, but I knew that whatever was going to happen, it was going to be way bigger than just me. So I looked at my coach, her name's Kate, and I told her what I was thinking. And I told her about the napkin. I actually had it with me, pulled it out. We were at a Starbucks. And uh, I said, this is bigger than me. I don't know what this is going to mean, but do you want to partner on this and do it together? She didn't know what it was going to mean either. We had no idea how we were going to fulfill on this, but she's like, woohoo. And yes, dipped her finger in the chocolate mocha, whatever she was drinking and smeared it on the napkin. And that's how we became business partners and started what became the coach's console 18 years ago. Do you still have the napkin? Is it framed somewhere? I do. It's framed. Oh, yes. I've never thought about it until just right now in having this conversation, but it was a partnership with the divine to put this out there. It was a mission that I accepted. And then I was, I was like, okay, how do we fulfill this mission? It wasn't an idea that I was like, hey, you know, I think it'd be great if we started a software company. Like that was not an idea I ever had. Never dreamt I would have a software company. But it was like, hey, let's eliminate the burdens and distractions of coaches so they can live their God-given potential. And then my question every day was, how do we help them eliminate their burdens and distractions? Oh, well, let's create a software. And then the how could evolve or change or stay solid as I asked that question, how can I? fulfill this mission. Yeah. And I I love the partnership with Spirit and that thank you for expressing that you really had a choice and some freedom because my experience is that the universe generally respects our no's Mm -hmm. and that we're, we're free to say that. We're free to say no. And we're also wildly free to say yes. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing, I think, about the divine and spirit. Truly no judgment. We're the ones that apply the judgment. I love it. Well, tell us, have your spiritual beliefs ever influenced the way you think or feel about money and abundance? Ooh, good question. Uh, Yes, they have. Yes, they continue to do so. And with regards to money, I was always very diligent with money growing up. Having a dad as a preacher and mom as a teacher, we didn't have a lot of money. We were never, I would never say we were poor. We never thought, oh, well, no, we won't have food on the table. But, you know, sometimes dinner was macaroni and cheese and applesauce. And I was very diligent as a result of that with money so that I didn't end up in that situation. And then when I started my business, my coaching business, uh, I was able to leverage the revenue that I generated. And then when I started my coach's console business, I went into this interesting place with money. And I think it was now looking back, it was just part of my own natural evolution and growth. I didn't know that that was what was happening at the time, but I got into a very dark place with money, got into a a lot of personal debt and a lot of dark, heavy emotions came up as a result of money. And so I had to take myself on this journey with money to remind myself that money is just another form of energy. It's an energy exchange and the currency, the actual bills or coins or checks or credit cards, you know, whatever the method is, is just the physical representation of that exchange of energy. But I had lost sight of that and forgotten that. And so I had gotten into a dark place with money and had to work myself through that and out of that so that I could embrace abundance and truly go from survival mode and just surviving into thriving then into affluence and beyond that. And I had to go through and really understand all those different degrees and 
my relationship with money became just that, a relationship, uh, like with a close friend. And I had to personify my money just like I had to personify my business to really understand that energetic exchange. What was something that you did on that journey that was that was super helpful, that helped you make some of the transformation that you needed to make? With regards to money? Yes. One of the things that I did, and this will maybe sound weird, maybe some people can relate to this. When I got into that dark place with money and I had a lot of debt, I would shove my bills in the drawer. I wouldn't even open them. I'm like, you know, if I just ignore them, they don't exist. Like, I, It's so weird to hear myself say this. I'm like, well, of course <laughs> they exist, Melinda. But that's, I got to that point where I was like, I'll just ignore it. And then everything's fine and got into that funky place. And that went on for a good while. And uh, I've, I hit this enough is enough moment. And I, I, all of a sudden, just this popped in my head. I didn't read this anywhere or hear this or nobody said this, but I was just sitting in my office and this popped in my head. I can still remember where I was sitting. And all of a sudden I was like, you know, if this was a lover, Melinda, that is a crappy way to treat a lover. They would never stick around. I think you should probably treat this as if it was a good friend, a best friend, or a lover and create a relationship with your money. Like if that were to be the case, how would you actually act towards your money? And I was like, oh my gosh, I would, first of all, I would never ignore it. I would have conversations with it. I would nurture it. I would support it. I would ask it, what's it what it needs. And all of a sudden I'm sitting there imagining my checkbook, my money accounts, as if it was a human and I personified it. And so every day I would ask, how would I nurture this relationship if it was another person? What would I stop doing knowing that it was another person? And it, I was like, I would never treat another human being like this. I remember that was a pivotal moment for me. Thank you so much for sharing that. that I, I just completely resonate with treating money as an energy that has its own thoughts and we can have our own relationship with it. Treating it like a lover, I've never considered. So thank you so much for that tip because <laughs> I, I now have a mission to make my husband jealous. So this is great. This is <laughs> You'll both win when you do that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so that's fantastic. Well, Melinda, tell us a little bit more about your company, about Coaches Console, exactly what you do and, and who you serve. Well, we serve other coaches. That's our primary focus is other coaches, all types of coaches, all niches. Really, we, we serve service-based entrepreneurs. So also a lot of consultants, healers, wellness practitioners, personal trainers, nutritionists, those kinds of entrepreneurs that have a gift and a set of services that when they work with their clients, help create transformation. And just like I said earlier, we help eliminate the burdens and distractions. What we know is that that thing you're gifted in, be it coaching or whatever your area of expertise is, you're great at that. Most often, you're not great at having your own business because you've never done this thing called a business. A lot of times people are employees, they go on a personal journey, they create transformation with themselves, and then they want to do the same for others and help others. And so we're here to create this transformation. But in order to do that, we have to have our own business or just go find a job doing that thing. But more times than not, because we're the creative types, the service-oriented types, we want to have our own business and do that because we want to have the freedom and the lifestyle that goes along with that. And so they're often not great at business. And so through our coaching and training programs, we help coaches and entrepreneurs understand what does it mean to have a business behind the scenes, everything from branding and list building to converting prospects, enrolling paying clients, serving and supporting your clients, getting referrals, nurturing referrals, working with strategic referral partners, leveraging your resources, uh, working with one-on-one -on -one or group programs. And so what it, what's everything that you need to have behind the scenes? in order for that to happen. You were talking earlier in the abundance tip when you're talking about dreaming big and that big dreaming leads to intentions. I think you said it leads to intention, which mm -hmm. leads to goals, which leads to tasks, Perfect. right? Is that what yes. you said? Yes, exactly. And with that, when we look at the tasks, when we can understand how to most effectively and efficiently operate behind the scenes, a lot of people will call them systems or processes or standard operating procedures, when we can outline that and be intentional about that, we free up a lot of our time and energy so that we can focus on dreaming bigger and then the flywheel just keeps going. 
And so we have to pay attention to behind the scenes and not just let it be so many entrepreneurs find it so daunting. It's like me with my money. It's just like, well, just ignore it and hopefully something will happen. But you can't just fly by the seat of your pants. Like you have to be very intentional, effective and efficient with your business, or you're going to just have this roller coaster revenue or this feast or famine, or you're going to love what you do and then hate what you do and love what you do and want to do more of it. But then you got to go to a job because you can't pay your bills. And it's just a funky experience. So we help people through our coaching and training and then through Coaches Console, our software, which is all that stuff that you need behind the scenes from opt-in pages to a contact list to an online calendar, sales pages, shopping cart, payment processing, uh, client portal, like the stuff that you got to have behind the scenes, that's in our one platform integrated. So you're not having to piece eight or nine different technologies together, learn them all, pay for them all and manage them all. That's amazing that I think that one stop shop um, is it serves so many entrepreneurs because it can be so overwhelming. And I love that you're paying attention to the details because a myth that I often hear from entrepreneurs is, oh, well, the right people will just find me because I'm putting the energy out there. Well, putting the energy out there is a significant thing that we have to do, of course, but we have to provide ways for people to be able to find us and yeah. with attention to all of this detail, right? It doesn't just sort of run itself. And my analogy from a from a kind of spiritual perspective, from my background, is Jesus didn't just stay in Nazareth and let people come to him. He went out to the community. <laughs> Yeah, he met them where they are. He went out to them. And what we're talking about is building trust. Yes, I think that's a big part of the equation is, well, when I put myself out there, I'll attract the right people and they'll want to work with me. That's true. And there's two other pieces to that. When somebody finds you and is attracted to you and says, oh my gosh, Susie, I think this would be great. You can't be sitting there going, oh crap, now what do I do? Because they're going to lose trust in you. The experience is going to be clunky. You're not going to be able to serve them in ways that you're able to serve them based on your talents and skill sets because of sloppy things behind the scenes. And the other piece of the equation, when I hear people say, I'll just attract the right people, what I have seen over the 18 years that I've been doing this is when things are not organized behind the scenes of our business, It makes us feel anything but confident. We do not feel professional. We feel like an imposter. We feel like a fraud. And because of that, what I find is it has people digging in their heels and being less willing to put themselves out there. And it it slows that energy down and it clamps that energy so you can't even attract the right people. It all goes hand in hand. It's not an either or. It's and all of the above. Yeah, so having really every single step of the process be very clear and strategic and well thought out creates this calm energy from which we can serve. Well, you've given us a bit of insight, especially about the origins of where spirituality and Coach's Console met. And today, how do your spiritual beliefs and practices influence the way you run your business? We like to make it about the people, not about the software. So right before the pandemic, the fall of 2019, every fall I would have my core team come together and we would look at, you know, what do we want to focus on for the next year? What's our big rocks? That type of thing. And what we knew is that in 2019, the marketing we'd been doing and all of that had been going on in our business, it was no longer working. It wasn't bad. We had just kind of plateaued. And we couldn't figure out how to catapult out of this plateau. And so at this fall retreat, I said, you know what? We're not going to, we spent the last 18 months kind of banging our head against the wall trying to figure this out. We're not going to bang our head against the wall anymore. And this was more of an intuitive sense that I had. And I've, I think that is the divine talking to us. And I've learned to listen to it over the years. And so I told my team, I was like, we're not, we're just going to stop banging our head against the wall and we're not going to market for this next year. We're just going to serve our members and love them up. And this was either going to be a very good thing or a very bad thing, because I'm not sure what business can get by without marketing and actively doing that. But I knew this was our next step. And so I trusted 
in that which is beyond me, that I would not have this sense if it were not true. And I took it to the team and they've also learned to operate in this way. So they rallied around it. And so we canceled our marketing efforts for 2020. And instead we created what we called our love them up plan over the next 12 months. How can we profoundly serve and support our users with all the resources that we have available to us to help them get results in their business? And we started rolling that out in January and February of 2020. And then we all know what happened in March of 2020. And so we had no event that we had to cancel. We had no launch that we had to pivot for. We had no marketing that we had to scramble for. We were already focused on loving up and serving our members. So I just put the accelerator to the floorboard and we just served our members through the pandemic, especially those first three months when it was so chaotic and frightening and scary. And as a result, a lot of our users, they continued to do the work in this world. They continued to feel good about the work they were doing in the midst of all the chaos and complexity. And they began to have some of their best years ever. Like none of that made sense in the fall of 2019. I mean, there were so many nights that I had, I'm like, I'm not going to do any marketing in my business. What kind of plan is that? So I struggled. My brain struggled with that for weeks and weeks. It was not a comfortable time for Melinda the human, but Melinda the spirit knew that there was something here and I trusted it. And I rallied my team so that we could have that collective trust with each other. And uh, we were able to kind of carry ourselves through it together when I would get in my doubt, my team members would bring me along, or if another team member would get in their doubt, we'd all bring that person along. And so we could borrow each other's trust and confidence moving forward until we found our footing again. And then it served us well because we were serving our members. They were so appreciative. They were leaning in. We created an incredible community, and it's led to a ripple effect that continues on. Referrals, understanding where our members need to be served and supported, where they don't. The feedback that we got was priceless. So it really led to then the following, or later that year, in the fall of that year, how do we need to put together a new campaign? The spring of the next year, what kind of event do we need to facilitate? And now we can continue to serve our members in greater ways. I love it. Um, that's so amazing. So I, I, what I'm hearing, I think, is a practice of deep listening and deep trust, even when you're in that very uncomfortable space as a result of your own practices and your own relationship that you've cultivated with the divine. Yeah. And a lot of meditating. I do a lot of meditation. Sometimes it's in the form of journaling. Sometimes it's in the form of uh like the spoken meditation, I might call a girlfriend and that's kind of a form of meditation. Sometimes it's just getting quiet, calming my mind so that I can hear where in my body am I hearing this voice come from? Is it from my head? But when it's from my chest, like between my throat and my solar plexus, I know that's a voice I better listen to. And it's interesting because it's our bodies that inform our brains, not the other way around. Right. And I think our our physical beings are the vessel that the universe and the divine speaks through. Melinda has spoken consistently about the importance of connecting mind, body, spirit to do this deep listening. This requires patience, a habit most of us have to spend some time developing, myself included, in our culture where we can access information so instantaneously, we also have to balance that with the wisdom that comes through doing nothing, through quietness, through acts of stillness. One thing that has helped me cultivate that in my own life is the consistent act of meditation. Meditation feels really scary to a lot of us, and you may have the idea that it's only the thing that the weird people do out there. But I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Meditation is simply the act of slowing down your brain waves. A lot of people believe they can't meditate because thoughts intrude whenever they try it for the first time. But let me tell you, that's exactly why we meditate, because we have thoughts that are intruding on us all of the time. And meditation helps us learn how to respond to those thoughts. 
Notice that I didn't say meditation helps you get rid of the thoughts. It may do that, but actually meditation is the act of noticing a thought when it comes into your mind. When we notice a thought that has intruded, we have done the act of meditation and we observe it and let it go. This is a very valuable skill and you can imagine all the thoughts that come into your head every day. If you have the power to observe them and let them go, how will that change your life? And that's what meditation assists us in doing. Another skill set to develop this quietness is the act of prayer. And if you think that prayer is only something that really wacky religious people do, let me clue you in on something special about prayer. Prayer is actually the act of being deeply uncertain and allowing God, source, universe energy in on your uncertainty. According to the very wise Anne Lamott, there really are only two prayers. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and help, help, help. People often think that prayer is telling God what we want, but in my experience, prayer is sharing with God where we are and allowing the divine to work in our lives through silence and stillness. Prayer can also be expressing lament. It can be telling God how angry you are at God in a very, very safe space. And God is big enough to handle absolutely any emotion that we may throw. Why do either of these actions, and are they the same thing? I do them because they help me connect to my interior spirit and to the timelessness that I believe is God. Even when I don't feel particularly connected during meditation or prayer, it is still worthwhile. After all, I have a human brain and sometimes it's just really active. The benefits of prayer and meditation aren't always in the moment, but afterwards, when we're in that space of deep listening, when we learn to respond rather than to react, and when we can heal an intruding thought with another thought, just like Melinda described. Are prayer and meditation the same thing? For some people, yes. I consider every meditation that I do to be an act of prayer. And many of my prayers are meditative. But prayer and meditation in all of their forms are part of the beautiful tapestry of weaving our lives together with the fabric of the universe. This deep listening that Melinda spoke about and that I've reviewed a little bit above is exceedingly necessary when we're in the places of uncomfortability in our lives and our businesses. But we don't start the deep listening in the place of uncomfortability. We begin it as a habit, as a practice, as an offering in our lives so that when we are in those tough places, we already know what to do. It's something that we can access. If you've never tried meditation, if you've never tried prayer, I invite you to consider beginning one of those practices for yourself. Feel free to mess it up so that you can begin the act of not perfecting, but practicing that inner stillness. You hinted at a time when you were on a journey with money uh, as one significant challenge in your entrepreneurial journey. What would you say has been your biggest challenge as an entrepreneur? Ooh, that's... Okay, so there's two ways I want to answer this question. One of my biggest challenges has been in using my voice. I am a behind-the-scenes introvert kind of gal. But when it came to starting my own business, the first several years, understanding how to talk about what I do, marketing, copywriting, oh my God, puncture my eyeball with a pencil, please. I did not want to have anything to do with it. I struggled with that so much. And it was excruciating. It still takes a lot of diligence and effort for me to do any sort of marketing and using my voice. But in the journey in my business, it's been about how to use my voice, how to be unapologetically, outrageously me inside my business. And then the other challenge is just how do I show up as a woman in my business, leading my business? And that woman who wants to focus on business and spirit and not lose sight of that and how to be a woman doing that, that's been another big challenge that I've been overcoming and getting better at every day. How does your spirituality 
inform the way that you greet these challenges? Massive compassion is one of the gifts that I've learned along the way is how to have massive compassion first for myself so that I can then have it for others. And it helps me to have courage in the midst of uncertainty. So that that massive compassion is kind of that first domino that happens that leads to everything else and uh, always takes me back to self-love. Yeah, when we can have compassion for ourselves and then for others, we're inhabiting the mind of the divine and that non-judgmental space. And in Hebrew, the word for compassion is related to the word for womb, for that womb space, that that compassion comes from deep within from our very insides. Mm, That's beautiful. Rahum is the word. And that passion is related to our physical body. It's born within us and it's touching part of God when we can cultivate that compassion rather than judgment and negating ourselves. What do you think of when I say being in alignment? Does that have any meaning for you? Uh, It does. It's interesting, that phrase. I hear that a lot. I want to be in alignment with the work I'm doing. I want to be in alignment with the message I'm putting out there. I hear that a lot from our clients and students and users. And when I hear be in alignment, truthful, authentic, those are the other things that I think about. Whatever is truthful and authentic for me, according to my values and my beliefs, being in alignment doesn't have to look any certain way. Being in alignment for me might be very different from what it means for you or anybody else listening in. Uh, But being in alignment just helps us to know that we have, helps me to know that I'm on the right path, doing the right thing, in the right way, with the right people at the right time. It's just, it's that sense of flow that I'm in. And I look for those synchronicities to help me know that I'm in that flow. Is That's the phrase that I use more rather than in alignment. Am I in flow? Because alignment to me, I think of the spine. I think of yoga and the body. Uh, Am I in alignment? Is everything where it's supposed to be? And if I'm not careful, that trips me over into that land of should. So that's why I like the word flow better because it has me continuing to move forward in a certain intentional way. Well, how do you know when you're out of flow? A crinkle in my forehead. Um, Things seem extra hard. Technology won't work. Nothing is going my way. My movements are very rigid and jerky. I um, will often cut off a conversation if somebody's talking because I'm not really present to it. And uh, I'm quick to insert something or I may not treat others as kindly as I would like to because I'm, I'm not in the flow. I'm not in alignment. Those are some of the indicators. Do you have a um, tried and true way that you get yourself back into that state of flow? The quickest way, fail safe way, four deep breaths, hand on chest, wherever you are. If you're driving, pull over. If you're driving, keep your eyes open, keep both hands on the wheel. But four deep breaths, just in for the count of four, out for the count of four. And just do those few in-breaths and you will get reconnected, realigned, back in the flow without having to figure anything out. And then from there, things can start falling back into place. So the breath work is my go-to all of the time. That's the quickest way. The other one that I use a lot uh, is shaking, where I'll shake my right hand. Then I'll shake my left hand, depending on the situation. I might shake my right leg, left leg, shoulders, head, back, whatever. But just that sense of shaking to help reset my nervous system, to help me kind of shake out of whatever was in the moment. Again, I'm a big fan of not having to dive in the story if I don't have to, because we can get lost down that rabbit hole. And I'd rather get back in the flow and keep moving forward. And so that the breath work, the shaking, and then there's a whole bunch of other tools that I use for that. Self-care is a big one for me, just consistently, regularly paying attention to self-care, not as a, oh, well, when I accomplish this task, then I'll celebrate and go do something nice for myself. It's never an afterthought. It's an ongoing part of how I show up in the business. So that's It's something that I do consistently. And because of that, it helps me to stay in the flow. Those are all so beautiful. And I I love that you're focused on this being a 
daily practice. And I practice box breathing as needed yeah. uh, throughout the day yeah. as well. And I love the shaking because it's so quick. It's something that animals do, and we are animals. Mm -hmm. And just like you said, they don't get wrapped up in a story about why that thing just happened to them. They literally shake it off. Well, Melinda, before we wrap up, do you have any advice that you'd like to share with our listeners or any wisdom? At the beginning of the intro, you talked about how it's the intersection of business and spirituality. And I would invite listeners to not compartmentalize. I mean, that's what this is, whole conversation and this whole podcast and all of your work is all about, but to not compartmentalize business or spirituality. But business is spirituality. It's an expression of the spirit within you coming into existence in this world. And to begin to see that simultaneously as one in the same, I think will allow you to tap into parts of yourself that maybe you didn't know existed or weren't courageous enough yet to bring out into voice or into manifestation, but to leverage your human existence to be the vessel that brings that into reality, brings it into existence. And our business is, for those of us that are called to have our own business, that is our playground. That is our spiritual playground where we are learning the lessons that this life has to offer that we are supporting others that are learning their lessons that their life has to offer. And our, our business is just the vehicle for us to have so much fun in this existence with the work that we're doing so that we can be whole and complete ourselves and we can be that beacon and model for others to let their light shine as well. Beautiful. Thank you so much. What is the best way for people to find you? Uh, coachesconsole.com is the best way. Coachesconsole, C-O-A-C-H-E-S-C-O-N-S-O-L-E.com. Uh, they can find out about our software coaching training and everything else that we've got going on in the world. Beautiful. Thank you so much. I'm Katie Valentine. You've been listening to Soul Savvy Business. Soul Savvy Business is part of the Miracy FM podcast network, which also includes shows such as Just Between Coaches with Melinda and Once Upon a Business. This episode was produced by Cynthia Lamb. I wrote this episode with Melissa Deal and Cynthia. Melissa Deal assembled the episode. Danny Eney is our executive producer and post-production was by Post Office Sound. To make sure you don't miss any great episodes coming up on Soul Savvy Business, follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now. And if you like the show, please give us a starred review. It is the best way to help us get these ideas out there to more people. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.